Hello everyone, welcome to Farwa's video series on planning the next normal. My name is Javad Khan and I'm the CEO of PSDF and the country head of Farwa's, the national accelerator on closing the skills gap in Pakistan, set up in partnership with the World Economic Forum. Farwa's has been set up specifically to reskill, upskill, and new skill the current and future workforce of Pakistan. So they are ready to embrace the impact of automation and technology. Parvaz is supported by the most influential business leaders from across Pakistan and sectors, and you will get to hear their perspectives on business outlook and jobs on this platform. Our guest today is Mr. Mohammed Aurangzeb, President and CEO of Fadeep Bank Limited. Aurangzeb is also a co-chair of Parvaz and leads the financial services working panel. Welcome to the platform, Aurangzeb. Thank you very much. Pleasure being here. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, asking you for a brief introduction uh, to uh, Habib Bank Limited. Um, so HBL is the, is the largest bank uh, in the country and there are various matrices through which that can be described. If we just look at the size and scale in terms of assets, in terms of deposits, so we have about 14% of the market share in, uh, in, in the, on the deposit side. Uh, our customer base is the largest in the country, so we are uh, a little north of 22 million customers uh, in, in Pakistan. So that's one matrix. The second one would be in terms of um, the reach and distribution. So we have the largest network with a little over 1,700 branches, and then number of alternative delivery channels. Uh, so 2,000 plus ATM network. Uh, we have roughly 50% of country's POS infrastructure. So about 25,000 POS machines. Uh, and then about 40,000 plus our branches banking agents. The third matrix uh, would be around just our lending portfolios. So we have the largest agriculture portfolio. We have the largest SME portfolio. We are the largest uh, card issuer in the country. Um, the last thing I want to mention is also a bank which has presence internationally. So we are very active in 12 countries and we are revving up our investment uh, in places like China, where inshallah we'll have our second branch uh, opening up in Beijing later on in the year. Now, because of all of this, um, State Bank of Pakistan, which is a central bank, has designated us as a DSIP, uh, as domestic systemically important bank in the country. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Aurangzeb. <clears throat> sure, COVID-19 has had this devastating impact on businesses around the world, and Pakistani businesses are no exception. How has that, uh, the, the, the pandemic impacted the financial services industry in general, and HPL specifically? So, Jabal, as you know, I mean, this is quite frankly the ultimate black swan event, right? Where we have seen, uh, you know, standstill of world economies, including that of Pakistan. And what is very particular about this one is the simultaneous suspension of production and consumption. Now, the only thing different in this one, which when I compare it to the GFC of 2008, when we went to the financial crisis, this crisis is actually not started with finance or banks. And I say that um, because of a specific reasons, that the banks generally have come into this crisis with healthy balance sheets, uh, healthy liquidity ratios, good capital buffers. And therefore banks have to be in our part of the solution uh, as, we, as we go forward. So as a DSIP, as I mentioned, I mean, HPL is very clear what we need to do in terms of resilience uh, uh, for our client base, in helping our clients, in helping our communities uh, in this time of need. Fantastic. And uh, what does this uh, pandemic mean for the, the current state of employment and jobs, uh, both in the financial services as well as HPL? Um, has, has the industry seen um, a lot of layoffs and in what specific roles or has the industry been able to retain and preserve most of the jobs? 
So, Jamaat, um, you know, the, the main uh, discussion point here is that right from the beginning, as you know well, um, that banking has been declared as an essential service. So, for practically speaking, throughout the last three to four months, we have had bulk of our operational network open. So I think there was a dip at one point in time where, you know, maybe overall in the industry and then in HBL, we had about 25 to 30 percent of our uh, branches closed. Uh, but most of the time, the operational network has been open. Also for us in HBL in particular, because as you know, we have been uh, leading the SRS emergency cash disbursement program. And that is the largest uh, emergency cash program in the history of the country. So as, actually, as of last Friday, we have dispersed close to $700 million, uh, about $110 billion, $112 billion rupees, to a little over 10 million beneficiaries. So quite frankly, you know, we have had to work um, more than full time to deliver on a number of these aspects. So to answer your question, it has had very limited impact, if any, on the employment in the banking industry because it has been uh, declared as an essential industry. That's wonderful. wonderful. And what uh, uh, is your perspective on the, uh, the outlook over the next 12 to 18 months? Were there any uh, specific plans, especially at HBL, uh, growth plans that uh, pre-COVID? And uh, have they changed? Have they been altered? Have they been stalled? Have they been modified? What does the outlook look for the over the next 12 to 18 months, especially when we're still uh, living in very uncertain times? Yeah, that is that is correct. Uh, but look, uh, at this point in time, we are all very focused um, to help our clients negotiate a very difficult period. And right now, we are all focused to ensure that what is a liquidity event for our clients and the customer base and the industries in general, right? Because it started with uh, a, a sort of a supply shock when we said, you know, China and, and Korean factories are closed. Then it became a demand shock when U.S. and, and, uh, and Europe closed down. And then we had the, the, the production facilities here closed down. Now... From a banking industry perspective, from an HVL perspective, we just need to make sure in conjunction with the central bank that we help the clients in terms of the liquidity crunch, in terms of all the reschedulings that we have done, all the financings that are being done at this point in time, so that this does not uh, turn into a solvency, into a solvency issue, where there would be, uh, you know, God forbid, any bankruptcies, etc., at some point in time. So as, as of now, um, I think the whole focus is to, to helping out the clients through this uh, liquidity event. So from our perspective, we have always been very clear that we will continue to invest in our uh, technology and our people through the cycle. And yes, it is a very extraordinary crisis, uh, but Jawad, we are not holding back from investing either in technology, uh, which quite frankly in times like these has already paid off in a big way, and then, of course, in our people agenda. Very good. So, you know, given that you're, you're quite bullish about the, the business outlook over the next 12 to 18 months, especially at HBL, uh, what would that specifically translate into in terms of employment and jobs for the youth? Uh, what are the specific areas uh, in which you will uh, either be upskilling or hiring new talent? Yeah, so, so John, I, I might start by saying that I'm not necessarily bullish, but I am uh, saying that we, you know, I, I don't think uh, other than China, we have seen a V-shaped recovery anywhere in the, in the world, uh, right? So in Pakistan, whether it becomes a U-shape or l shape, I mean, only time will tell. Uh, the reality is we've seen the, the recent budget, uh, the GDP growth forecast has been slashed uh, right in the negative territory. Now, banking is going to uh, you know, is, is in a derived demand business, so there will be impact. All I'm saying is at this point in time, you know, we don't see a major bankruptcy or, or uh, NPL issue for the banking industry, 
if we do the right thing in helping out the clients over the next sort of six to eight months uh, during this liquidity crunch. Um, having said that, I mean, your question is, you know, wh where are the, the, the employment uh, opportunities and how would people look? Look, you know, I can only speak for, for my own institution at this point in time that we used to take, quite frankly, weeks in coming to a decision. And over the last sort of three to four months, you know, it, it's, it's a question of agility on steroids, right? So we have to sort of build that muscle memory that everything that we have been doing as an institution, as an organization, and a lot of this has been data-driven decision-making, right? Where we, we, we have uh, people working remotely, et cetera. So, so people, especially the youth, who have been involved and who will continue to be involved in um, data analytics, AI, technology overall, I think they just have huge prospects as we, um, as we go forward. Uh, because, you know, it, some of the imprints that have been left and it's still an unfolding story. So we don't know when and how it's going to end. Uh, but I see a big upside for all of that, those youth who are tech savvy. Interesting. So that's about the, the new opportunities. But, uh, you know, let me talk a little bit about your current workforce. You know, the, the, the obviously the, the budgets have been shrinking. And, uh, you know, we're also living in a new, new reality, which most of us have not seen before, which is work from home. So given these two uh, situations, uh, how are you uh, catering to the learning and development needs of your current workforce? Uh, there, is online learning becoming uh, the new normal in how we cater to the learning and development needs? Yeah, I, I think the e-learning modules, and we had we were already on that path uh, in making sure that we, we we scale that up. But post COVID, we quite frankly didn't have too much of a choice but to bring down the classroom training uh, quite um, quite low for for obvious reasons in terms of new SOPs, social distancing, etc. But you know what um, what learning and development has gone over the last two to three months is just amazing in terms of flexible hours, duration, and just the size and scalability of it, right? Because we are now all into a broadcast mode. It's not a question of, you know, 20 people or 30 people, you know, Zoom can take what? You know, 200, 300, 400. So just, you know, this broadcast mode has, in my view, um, just transformed this whole uh, sort of um, learning and development uh, and, and, and the virtual platforms which have, have brought in. And this is not just restricted, quite frankly, these are our own internal uh, learning and development. But as you have seen, and uh, I'm sure you would have been on some of these webinars, we have done a number of these now uh, for our client base as well, uh, right? And, and we just did a, a, a trade webinar, I think about 350 plus clients joined that trade webinar, which was all about you know, how, how we are going to um, take this uh, into the digital world. And about the 350 clients who, who joined us, not only from Pakistan, but from internet, international locations as well. So size, scale, duration, broadcast mode. Wonderful. Fantastic. So that is uh, then, uh, you know, it's a great segue into my next question, which is, you know, this pandemic has, uh, has necessitated us to be to become more innovative and become innovative fast uh, and in order to ensure business continuity uh, what are those two or three such innovations do you, do you think that are going to become a permanent part of your ongoing business and operating model yeah i think that's a great question javad and you know i um you know, the way I look at it, what we have gone through as an organization, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a multi-act, right? So wave one was crisis response. Wave two is adapting to the new norm, including the way we are communicating to each other right now. And wave three is exactly what you are talking about. So that is very much work in progress in terms of what are going to be part of that muscle memory and the permanent features that are going to be, um, that are going to be with the organization in a world of coexistence or in the post-COVID world. 
Now that, quite frankly, is work in progress. But but from my perspective, Javad, I am very very clear that the operating model is going to change. It's a question of degree. And you know the two or three aspects. Certainly, innovation on the HR side. We have been talking about flexible hours. We have been talking about remote working. Now, as of now, roughly 30% of our workforce, and this we have a total workforce of about 22,000 people, are are working from home. And we have moved, uh, you know, in a very seamless manner in terms of managing the largest institution in the country, uh, in terms of, um, in, in, you know, remote working. So HR. Then the second one is client engagement. How do we actually interact with our clients? What tools we are going to use going forward? What is the role of travel that's going to be? Right. I mean, previously all these road shows and capital market road shows, we would be uh, jumping up and down into the planes, outside the planes, and, and you know that has uh, you know worked out sort of quite well. So we are very quite focused on uh, on this. And and then the last one is the is the real estate, right? It's all connected. You know, in terms of density and in terms of uh, you know social distancing, in terms of do we really need all of this real estate in terms of our investment strategy going forward? So you know, to sum it up, I mean, I you know, it's become a cliche, uh, Javad, that you know, people say there you know decades where nothing happens and there are weeks in which decades happen. So and that's exactly what has happened with digital transformation. So I think that is going to be the key theme here. And then everything in and around it, whether it's people, whether it's real estate, whether it's our client engagement, all of these areas have gone through innovation, and you know we will continue to move in that uh, on that path going forward. Uh, or is it? Do you think the uh, some of the actions uh, and the innovations that you talked about, uh, do you see them happening across the financial services industry? And do you think there is a need for some kind of a collective action at the industry level uh, to make uh, these changes permanent? I think there are a couple of things. One, obviously, um, you know, a lot of this. You know, the, the reality is, you know, people who are going to be winners versus laggards. You know, quite frankly, if I look at our own institution. the fact that we were able to scale up our payments collections mobile apps uh, and use of digital channels and mobile apps to start offering uh, personal loans credit cards over the last 4 to 5 months is because we have been on that um, journey in terms of investment technology over the last 3 to 4 years there is no magic wand to it So, so I think here it was a question of all sort of scaling it up, and the fact that we have a little over 2.4 million um, active mobile uh, app users through our Connect and and uh, and through our um, uh, HBL mobile app certainly gives us a leg up. Uh, so, so there is you know all the industry who are sort of you know have been focusing on technology and not just brick and mortar. I think will come out very well. Others will have to learn, will have to invest in a big way. So I do think you will start seeing, you know, the differentiation which was beginning to happen in the industry in terms of people who are on the front versus the laggards. You know that gap uh, increasing. But I do think as an industry, everyone has realized the importance of digital transformation. The other is keeping people employed. Yeah. Right? How do we keep people employed in our in our industry and I think there the industry is already, uh, Javad, in my view, stepping up in a very big way, uh, including ourselves, in terms of the Rozgar scheme from the central bank. Right, as you know, uh, as as it is actually in the papers uh, today that State Bank has, you know, extended that scheme for another three months, uh, and we have dispersed close to about 17 billion rupees to various companies across client segments so that they can keep their own people employed. Uh, in in uh, in the various sectors. Coming back to the industry, as I mentioned, we were and remain an essential industry. But right now, we are all focused to bring first of all all these people back into uh, you know in, into the workforce, uh, back to the extent that we need them in our offices in the first instance, and then we can think about roles and responsibilities going forward. Yeah. So you know. Uh... 
lastly, I just want to, uh, you know, I'm, we're all aware of the sentiment uh, amongst the youth, which is, you know, these are very uncertain and despondent times uh, for them, especially these young people that were supposed to graduate from colleges and universities. You know, they were not able to, in certain cases, complete the programs, got an online graduation. You know, some of them lost their jobs and are looking for new jobs. So in these very despondent and uncertain times, what is the one positive message uh, that you can give to the youth um, generally or about the, the financial um, services industry or about HBL specific? So, Jawad, here my optimism would come in because I am a half class full person. And, you know, I... Um, you know, if I can say it in Urdu, ye, ye mulka khuda daad hai. So it has, a, this country has seen a lot of adversities. And, and of course, this is an extraordinary crisis. Uh, but this country also has proven its resilience through the cycles. I have no doubt it's going to bounce back, uh, inshallah, uh, sooner, than, sooner than later. But I do think this is a bit, a bit of that downtime, if, if you want to call it that where we have a fantastic opportunity and the youth have a fantastic opportunity because of the way we are communicating now, the world is open to them. You know, it's, it's not any campus, it's not any specific classroom. They can today access anyone everywhere around the world. This is the time for them to invest, invest in themselves, uh, right? In terms of every opportunity which is coming through e-learning and quite frankly, equip themselves, especially in the in the technology and the digital space. And I'm not talking about, quite frankly, you know, everyone has to be a programmer. Therefore, I use the word tech savvy, right? And and uh, and and the youth, and and of course, there will be opportunities in the in the IT infrastructure. There will be opportunities in uh, people who want to be in the incubation centers, people who are going to um, uh, be in the front line. But the people who are going to be in the front line, and that's where the youth who invest in tech savvy, and as I said, in the, in the, the client engagement models are going to change, right? People who are going to, you know, use these digital channels. And, and that's what they should do. Use this downtime to invest in themselves. I do think this is a fantastic opportunity for them. Uh, and and when, they, when they come back in, and it's not just banking, I mean, but across the, the industry, uh, you know, they can use this technology because I, I, I can tell you, you know, there are, there were people, of course, we talk about large corporates, Javad and, and very sophisticated corporates, but there were people in the SMEs, you know, if I call them, you know, a, a bit of a safe culture where he would say, or she would say, you know, every check has to be signed by me. And I tell you, there's been such a transformation that you know, they've come onto our payment portals because even if they want to, they can't. So this, you know, with that necessity, you know, if uh, you know people who are uh, you know in my age bracket uh, or 60s or 70s who have changed their lifestyles in a huge way, these youths, I mean, they have a huge opportunity in front of them to invest in them. They'll come out okay out of this. Inshallah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander, for taking the time to talk to us. It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Stay safe. And I wish you and PSTF all the very best. Thank you so much.